Hello and good afternoon from Austria. It's a great pleasure for me to have the occasion to give this online webinar together with the AlphaGate company. My name is Michael Payer. I'm at the Medical University in Graz in Austria at the Department of Oral Surgery. The topic we are discussing today is a series of rich expansion techniques and together we together today we will focus uh, the topic of concepts of tissue preservation. For that, my dear colleagues, please allow me to take you uh, to our university clinic here in Graz in Austria. This is our primary care unit where we treat approximately 25,000 patients per year, which is good for dental education, which is also good for our studies and science. And um, out of that, um, within our surgical facility, that's um, our surgical rooms here, we have approximately about 3,000 surgical interventions per year. From that, there is in between something like six to 800 implant surgeries. And if we look at these numbers, in approximately 50 to 75%, we need regenerative procedures. So the question we have to ask ourselves at this stage is why do we lose so much tissue after tooth extraction? That in some cases, our patients look like this, where you can see severely resorbed alveolar ridges, only remnants of an alveolar crest. And so, and you know, in these patients, um, implant treatment, of course, as you all know, is not so straightforward as we would like to. What is the reason? We all know that teeth are fixated um, in the alveolar crest um, by the periodontal ligament of the unit, um, the cementum, the chape fibers, which go from the tooth to the um, surrounding tissues to the so-called bundle bone. And this bundle bone is there because it has the function to main the tooth in position in the alveolar crest. And if you extract the tooth, this bone loses also its function and everything that doesn't have any function anymore is very likely to be resorbed uh, by our body. If you look at studies, um, that's not new knowledge. If you look at the study by Tan and co-workers, uh, we can see in a systematic review, the tooth extraction leads uh, to buccolingual shrinkage of approximately three to four millimeters, which is quite a lot in average. Also in a vertical dimension, we can see, an, um, and this is also um, quite severe, we can see especially pronounced on the buccal side, we can see a reduction of approximately one to 1.5 millimeters. And what has also been shown that we can see um, significantly less atrophy in patients with a thicker buccal plate and a thicker uh, buccal soft tissue. So these are the patients um, that are less likely to have this shrinkage on the buccal side after the tooth extraction. And the patients with thin uh, buccal plate and a thin biotype are the ones that are more likely also to develop recessions and also to have a, um, to have a, a shrinkage more pronounced um, after tooth extraction. So the patients with a um, Thin biotype, they are our risk patients when they have the teeth, but this goes on also when they lose uh, their teeth because the atrophy in these patients will be significantly higher than in the patients with the thick biotype. So um, why is that so? And um, if we look at these anatomical sections, uh, we can see this is a upper incisor and this is a premolar, this is a lower incisor. We can see um, that the surrounding bone around this tooth, this is the bundle bone, is very, very thin. And this is 200% bundle bone. And this 
thin bundle bone we find, especially in the zones where we do not want to have it thin. And this is in the aesthetic zone. So we can predict quite, um, quite uh, reliable that when we extract the tooth in the aesthetic zone and we do have this thin biotype, we will prox uh, very probably lose um, up to, and if you look at this crest here in the, in the most left slide, uh, up to 50%. And all this, and also we know this from studies, is happening within the first uh, six, to, 6 to 12 months. So um, and the same here in the lower incisor area. So uh, if you look at the literature, uh, there's been tons of publications on this topic on, on uh, rich pre uh, preservation. Um, I can tell you already now, there's no principal recipe, but there are a common things by uh, publications um, that all have in common. What can we do to maintain or even increase this tissue volume? First of all, they say an atraumatic extraction. So we have to be gentle with the tissue already at the, um, during the procedure of tooth extraction. Then we also need to, um, reduce the process of inflammations. So this means that we need to decontamine uh, the extraction socket. And this is um, what is very important. We do need a stable blood clot, a playable coagulum. This is because this is the, this is the substance uh, from where all the healing, the bone tissue healing, the soft tissue healing starts with stem cells coming in there, growing in there. So these are the parameters that are very clearly described. So the atraumatic extraction, what can we do? So um, there's different techniques, there's different devices. For example, this panic extractor, which is a very helpful device uh, where you absolutely do not touch the surrounding tissue. You have a screw, it's like a screw pull, like opening a bottle of, of wine. Um, and and this is this is one device which works very nicely, especially for for root remnants. And um, so that's that's a very good suggestion. If you have a multiple rooted teeth, and here we go back to to basic knowledge from dental school, uh, we very much like to separate these teeth um, because um, the tooth is going to be lost anyway, but we do not like to touch the surrounding bone. So in this case of a lower molar, for example, um, we um, um, dissect the mesial from the distal root. In the upper molar, we have the two buccal roots and the palatal root. So, so you know that. And so we do this with a, with a, um, with a burr, a piece of burr, then we uh, take the elevators and then we can uh, root by root uh, remove the, uh, these without touching the alveolar crest. What has been described in an in a, uh, oral surgical book, if we do have some root remnants um, and we need to expose the area just to, to, to get, uh, get there, we don't raise a full flap. And instead of using the thickest burr, uh, we use our thinnest burr or even better, uh, we don't use any burr and take some piezo devices, periotomes, they have, they have been proved to be very helpful to mobilize uh, roots and also, but also manual instruments are very, are very helpful. And uh, with that, it is, it is very easy and very atraumatic to, to remove um, every root here. So there's this saying that with the root or with the tooth, um, we can do whatever we want. The tooth belongs to the surgeon, but the bone should stay with the patient. So we do not like to interfere too much with the tooth surrounding bone. If we need to raise a flap, we do this also very gentle. We just do a, a crestal incision and mobilize the uh, upper part and we do not like to raise a full flap. So because we know when we raise a flap, when we remove the periosteum, also this may lead to a, a resorption of the surrounding bone here. So the atraumatic extraction is, is uh, already a key um, issue uh, for tissue preservation. So this is for the technique for the root removal. 
then we said we do not like to leave the tissue, the, the inflammation tissue in place. We like to uh, remove the infected tissue, granulation tissue, and also to induce some bleeding. Of course, we do not do a curettage because other, with that we, we are, will harm and traumatize also the bone, but we like to remove the infected tissue very gentle in order so we have a stable blood clot and also a good healing. What we use uh, in the molar areas, especially in the, in the lower jaw, uh, are the gelatin sponges in order just to stabilize the blood clot. And also you have some, some uh, it's a protection to, for food entering in the extraction socket, which is, uh, which is good within the first couple of days, but this is resolved very quickly, but it's just a primary closure and also a stabilization of the blood clot. So, and if we have multiple tooth extraction, we just also like to adapt the tissue very gentle uh, in order to uh, stabilize the, the coagulum. So that's already um, very much you can do at the time point of tooth extraction, the atraumatic technique for uh, tooth removal. Is there any indication for further action? And the answer is uh, yes, but um, it's limited, at least um, uh, this is also what, what tells us the literature and also in, in our center, um, it's limited and it's also worthwhile in the areas where we really fight for every millimeter of tissue. This is the aesthetic zone. What options do we have there? Um, the oldest option for tissue um, um, preservation was the immediate implant placement then very often discussed is filling the extraction socket with different materials, be it uh, autogenous bone, be it uh, bone substitutes, um, and also soft tissue augmentation. And this is very often combined with the filling of the, of the extraction socket. So we will also discuss that, this, uh, the soft tissue augmentation um, after root, uh, after tooth extraction. And also this, actually, this is my favorite, uh, favorite technique for tissue preservation is the tooth transplantation, which we very much like uh, to do um, in young patients where there is a very good uh, perspective uh, for the tooth, um, for the tooth, for the transplanted tooth, and also for the tissue preservation. And there's also a long standing tradition here in our clinic. At the end of the lecture, we will show you some cases on this technique as well. So uh, the immediate implant placement was, um, it's nothing new. It's, it's almost as old as implant dentistry uh, itself. And it also has quite a, quite a good, um, survive, uh, quite a good um, survival rates and, and also success rates. But we have to be aware, especially in the aesthetic zones, especially when we place multiple, uh, multiple implants next to each other, we and in the patients with the, of the thin biotype, we may run into the risk of um, seeing some tissue decrease over the years and, and seeing some not very nice looking recessions. But um, immediate implant placement is supported by the literature. There's also a very nice systematic uh, review uh, recently published by German Gallucci showing, showing um, good percentages of survival also for immediate immediate approaches so let me show you one case which um which we which we did some years ago so in our center uh immediate implant placement and immediate restoration is limited to patients with a thick buccal blade and also a thick biotype and we do not like to place more than one to two implants and uh, so it's 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 for a selected kind of patient, it's, um, it's a functioning procedure, but it takes more skills, probably more practice already. And this is probably nothing you want to start with, especially not in the aesthetic zone. So it, it works, but um, it's also takes some training and, and in, the, in the right hands, you will achieve probably also very good, good uh, results with immediate, immediate approaches. So one case I will show you, which we did some years ago together with um, a colleague from our department, uh, Dr. Philip Koba. Uh, this patient is a trauma patient and the two incisors had to be extracted, one for root fracture, one for uh, poor endodontic prognosis and also crown fracture here. And so, but it, you know, you can see that the tissue looked 
looks very good. It's a, it's a thick uh, bio type. And uh, we were placing a central incisor and uh, a lateral incisor uh, next to each other. This is a concept we can discuss. Some, from today's point of view, I would maybe place only one implant in the central incisor uh, situation and, and have a cantilever there. In this situation, we are placing in a flapless manner two implants. This is a first provisional for the soft tissue forming and this is the situation um, this is the situation um, in 2019, so from last year, so this is over 11 years, situation looking quite stable um, with, without any infections and uh, implants and, and crowns still being in place. So another um, immediate implant placement, and this is a technique which I would just would like to briefly mention and show to you, the so-called sock chill technique also trauma patient, um, uh, middle-aged female. And uh, so she had root fractures here as well uh, from the lateral, um, uh, from the left central incisor. We extracted this and used the technique of socket preservation. And uh, when you do that, we will still come to this later. Uh, you have to wait for for approximately six months, otherwise you um, because you need to allow the tissue to heal there. So we um, extracted this left central incisor and um, also did a uh, soft tissue, a free gingival graft there. Waited for six months, and in the during the healing period, the lateral incisor uh, fractured as well. You can see the fracture here on the X-ray. Um, and so, but, and so this one, uh, the left lateral, uh, the right lateral incisor had to be removed as well. Uh, but um, she did not want to have any, any further treatment on this right central incisor. She was really traumatized from this multiple extraction. So we, the concept was to, uh, we already did the soccer preservation here, but to do, and, and to do an immediate implant here in this in this situation because she was uh, also of a bit thick biotype, so I extracted the uh, upper lateral incisor on the right side as well, and this is the socket preservation here on the on the left side with the um, hydroxyapatite uh, bone substitute we are filling in there and the free gingival graft, and on the right side it happened like this that the tooth fractured like that that we have. Um, a, a part of the of the root stayed in position on the buccal position, and this uh, I this happened uh, really during during the extraction without having it planned. And I could remember a publication uh, by Mark Hürzel and Otto Zu about the so-called socket shield technique, and this is clearly the concept of this publication to leave a root remnant uh, intentionally in the buccal position here, in order to stabilize also the bundle bone because you know. As we mentioned before, we have the Chape fibers going from the surrounding bone to the, to the root. And, um, and you place the implant just palatella, palatella of, this, of this root. So most of, our, of the listeners uh, will probably know this technique. There there's has been quite some, some, um, some discussing about this technique. I, I, as I say to the final evidence uh, um, according to my knowledge is still is still missing but I, I I really wanted to try this since the first publications by uh, the two and Mark Hürzel were quite promising and I can show you also some slide what was the concept what they observed in an animal model they um, left intentionally uh, the root uh, part of the root in position you can see the bundle bone on the buccal side this is the root remnant, and uh, after some month, you can see new cementum going, uh, growing onto the implant surface. So it, it worked out very nicely in the animal model. So during surgery, I, dis I discussed this with the patient. She was very happy and, and willing with uh, about this idea, and you can see how I placed the implant. You can see the root remnant here. And if you look at the result after five years, this is uh, still everything in a provisional restoration because uh, w this is our question mark, this central incisor, which works quite nicely. And if you look, compare these two teeth you are here on the upper left uh, central incisor, you can still see also a nice curvature, but if we can see the scarring from the G free gingival graft. And if you look at the lateral incisor here on the upper right side, 
it seems almost untouched. So uh, it worked out very nicely in this patient, but um, this should not be understood as a recommendation. It was just a trial and, and also maybe one option of, of how to maintain, maintain the tissues tissues here, which worked out nicely in this case, but we're following this case and a couple of other cases with great interest and we will see what the future will bring and hope to, to provide you with more knowledge maybe um, during the next webinars. So this was immediate implant placement. I already mentioned this also the classic, I would say almost method for ridge preservation is filling the socket with a with uh, some material, maybe autogenous material or, or bone substitutes. Um, however, all these bone substitutes, they, they are so far only osteoconductive and may even on the short run inhibit wound healing. So this means when you, when you fill a, an extraction socket with the bone substitutes, you may even have to wait a little bit longer until you will find something that uh, will be an advantage for your implant placement. So um, our concept and also if you, if you believe the publication something like six months uh, after filling up the extraction socket with a slowly resorbing hydroxypatide is the minimum you should wait for. But on the long run, there's also quite supporting publications as well. Uh, so um, that, this this may also be of use but however it's not 200 percent predictable and we don't have the absolute knowledge uh today already uh that gives us clear indications in which patient this in which patients this will work and then and in which patient uh we will um we will not see too many of this effect i will also show you two cases where it worked out one very nicely and the other one we could still see quite a resorption where we were filling up the, the material. So what's uh, something new, there's uh, also experimental trials that read some, some colleagues. Uh, this is a, a study group from Zurich that was using, uh, I like the interest, but the evidence also in this method is, is, not too, um, is not too evident yet of using the tooth material. Um, because in some, in some cases also this works out very nicely and, and the other cases it may lead to infections. But I just want to, so not too much evidence. I like the idea, but also no recommendations so far due to lack of evidence. So our concept, how about um, the evidence for filling, filling the, the um, extraction socket with a bone substitute. Here's a nice study by a group from Munich um, that compared four different treating groups. In the group number one, they were using um, um, uh, bone, um, bovine bone mineral, a hydroxyapatite plus a free gingival graft um, here in this one. In the other group, they were using a free gingival graft alone. In group number three, they were only filling up the extraction socket and in the control group, the group number four, they uh, didn't do anything with the extraction socket. And um, looking at the results, um, it showed that in the, there was the least resorption in the group where there was the uh, bovine bone mineral plus the free gingival graft, but almost, um, almost um, the same result was, could be seen in the group where there was only the free gingival graft. And there was, um, between group one and two, um, there was a, signif a significantly less resorption compared to the group um, where there was nothing done. So, uh, and this study shows obviously very nicely what uh, gives us a very good input, which, and this is also the, the simultaneous uh, soft tissue augmentation with the, uh, with the free gingival graft. So it's not only filling up the extraction socket, but the free gingival graft seems to additionally limit the external contour shrinkage. So this is something um, we need to keep in mind. And this is something um, also we integrated um, in our, into our treatment concepts. So the question here is, does, is it enough when we, when we, when you just augment the soft tissue, that's, that's almost a philo philosophic, um, question, um, some, 
scientists, especially from the periodontal group, say yes. But there's also, um, um, according to us, according to our center, there's also clear arguments um, to fill the uh, extraction socket. Um, and I'm going to show these to you, uh, where we do fill also the extraction socket with the bromine bone mineral. So the main input obviously seems to be the soft tissue augmentation. When do we fill the socket? It's always when we when we have uh, sufficient time where time doesn't play a, play a matter and we can give the tissue enough time to heal. So always when we have a late implant placement, when we have large defects, um, where we need to wait longer, we also like to uh, fill up the defect in areas where we uh, prepare the, the site for a pontic, where we do not worry too much about the bone quality within a short uh, period of time. So we give under the pontic, the tissue has enough time to heal. And also in the patients where we know where they are very likely to see um, um, resorptions and, and recession, these are the patients with the thin biotype. Let me show you one patient. He was, um, um, sh he was um, uh, consulting our center for, for implant placement and he, he was traveling a lot. So it was foreseeable that he would after tooth extraction would not be able to come before a period of six to seven months. So we extracted the tooth, filled it up with, um, um, with the hydroxyapatite, filled it with, um, with a free gingival graft, augmented it. And um, this is the situation after that. And you, we suture it with single button sutures. And um, this is at suture removal. Don't uh, be worried when you see a superficial discoloration of the, of the free gingival graft after, after seven to 10 days. This is a superficial necrotizing of epithelium, which is secondarily uh, then overgrown by the surrounding tissue. And this is the situation after seven to eight months. Um, here, very inviting for implant placement, also from the bony aspect. Uh, we did a um, uh, open healing here in this side. Uh, this is after second stage surgery, and this is the first provisional with everything, uh, all the tissues very stable. This is uh, as another case, uh, the second indication uh, for us to fill, which is a preparation for a pontic, a, quite a young patient. If you look at his denture, 35, and he was uh, about to have this lateral incisor extracted uh, as he already had on the other side. And um, he complained uh, before extraction uh, that he didn't like the tissue collapse here on this left upper lateral incisor. So we. I told him I will try to, to augment it. And I was taking the, the root, um, I was removing the, the roots on the, underneath the bridge and filled it up with the hydroxyapatite and said it may, it may occur uh, resorption still in spite of the augmentation. Could you already see at the time of extraction some, some quite a recession here at this, at this canine. Um, but however, two years later, it looked like this. You can see no, no sign of tissue collapse. Also, this stayed quite, uh, the soft tissue stayed quite nicely in position. If you compare it to the collateral side on the upper left side, you can see quite a difference uh, here, this collapse, which he did not like at all. And here we could at least uh, maintain a little bit the volume um, here during, uh, under this, under this ponting. Another indication to fill, um, in, in a case where we um, were going for a late implant placement because the patient was, uh, was, it was the prosthodontic concept was not quite clear because the patient uh, was also suffering from some periodontal problems. So the period treatment started uh, by, by my colleague, Dr. Beros Arefnia. And uh, so we were not quite sure where, um, where we would start we would um, how the how the treatment would end. The option was um, option was to go for a, for um, a bridge restoration in the in the upper incisor area, or or an implant uh, supported restoration here with this central incisor. And this is um, also a previous trauma um, trauma patient um, the the very young age where the tooth ankylosed and uh, the surrounding tissues were still growing and this central incisor 
um, getting longer and longer because you know the, the ankylos tooth is like an implant uh, which you place at an early stage and the crown got longer and longer and uh, so she complained about uh, this long um, this long tooth here and so so we, we tried we tried to to give her a perspective for for improvement so she did very nicely in the period treatment so we tried uh the plan was then to go for implant placement um and but before that i asked um, um our orthodontic department friend and colleague dr martin bender he did an orthodontic extrusion for me just to um, get as much tissue as possible um, uh, with from this root so he extruded the tooth and by that the idea was to to move also the tissue uh, in a coronal position and this worked out quite nicely here after some months the tooth got longer and you need to shorten the tooth but we could gain some some millimeters and then before the tooth was extracted orthodontically we extracted it with the forceps but you could see already very nicely that the uh, tissue had had improved here you could see a thin buccal plate, but um, the period treatment was still going on. So we were going for a, for um, a late implant placement here in this area. And so we filled up, sorry, uh, we filled up the um, extraction site, did a free gingival graft here from the palate. Uh, this is a slowly resolving a hydroxyapatite. Then again, the fixture with the single button sutures and um, the, um, the, here's some gauze just to to stop some minor bleeding here. Whenever you, you take the um, frigidal graft, if you stay mesially to the first molar, uh, you're you're on a safe side according to the to the run run of the position of the vessels there. And here you can see, as I mentioned previously, also the superficial necrotic tissue here. This should not worry you. After some months, uh, after one month already, you can see some some nice uh, new tissue coming in there. It is after three months, after six months, you can see a huge gain of. You can see the free gingival graft, the original position of the free gingival graft, huge gain of soft tissue, um, and um, they're also very promising, um, very good results from the bony aspect. So we had just had to do some minor augmentation here. This is the first provisional restoration. We always start very narrow and try to move the, the tissue and the papilla into its position. And here, this is the situation where we started. And this is the situation after, after some months. Um, this is where we started. This is where the implant is. So we do have quite some, some gain of tissue here and still some reserve and this is the situation five years after surgery so quite a stable quite a stable result so in this case it worked out very nicely um, now I'm, i will show you a case where we still could see a resorption even if we did uh, some some tissue preservation techniques here with same um, same area central incisor that had to be extract because of the fracture here there's a huge post here there was some endodontic surgeries at fistula so this tooth unfortunately had to be removed same concept uh, filling up with hydroxyapatite free gingival graft thick biotype um, and here we were producing together with uh, a colleague from the prostate department uh, Martin Kola a, a um, milled milled drill guide for the pilot drilling here um, this is the situation however after after six months you can see can see quite quite a collapse of the defect even though we did everything uh, we we could in in this side so we can see a very nice uh, soft tissue paper uh, condition with enough keratinized still a thick type but we can see quite a collapse here even though even uh, almost like someone had put his finger here and put it uh, with his thumb, thumb inside so however um, so we were aware that we will need to secondarily augment it uh, we were uh, starting the surgery most important no vertical incisions here uh, here the guided pilot drilling implant in correct position uh, and here the regular GBR technique with the hydroxyapatite, uh, uh, collagen membrane, then we closed everything. Here you can see again from the flap design, no vertical incisions here. 
uh, with the implant in place. This is after some weeks, second stage surgery um, and intraoral scanning. Here the screw retained first provisional. This is where we start with a co quite concave shaped uh, emergence profile at the beginning. This we augment in order to, to contour the soft tissue. This is the first try-in. You can see still the lack of papilla and by adding bit by bit, we end up in a situation like this after, after some weeks. And this is the situation with the final restoration. So even though we did second, uh, even though we did our socket preservation, we could not prevent the secondary augmentation here in this central incisor case. So now you will say, well, still it's, it's uh, super easy, but I'm going to show you a case now where it was not super easy, where it did not work out uh, as nicely. And the, and the other cases, this was a 42 year old trauma case uh, after a motorcycle accident. So he almost died in the, in the accident. And, but you can see he had multiple fractured root remnants that were not only horizontally fractured, but also vertically. So they unfortunately had to be removed. Um, and, but anyway, also here in this patient, um, we were trying to maintain as much tissue as possible. We did socket preservation, uh, soft tissue grafting. And um, this is how it looked after a root removal. And we were quite confident, but the patient left after some months because he had to go to rehabilitation after his accident and uh, came back after nine months. And if we looked at the x-ray when he returned again, we already could see a, a quite a severe vertical, um, quite a severe vertical resorption here in, in this um, in this area, especially in the upper left zone. So we knew that we would need to go also from the 3D imaging, uh, need to go to um, a stage three construction process. And this is uh, what we did here. Uh, we took an intraoral uh, bone graft, uh, some block grafts in a vertical and horizontal dimension, which healed and worked out very nicely. So also the implant placement worked worked out quite well, but still we had a huge loss of tissue and the referring dentist had to compensate, the prosthodontist had to compensate it with a uh, pink gingiva. But you know, the patient was very happy. Everything is still in position after, after many years. And he was very happy that he survived. So, so, but also to show you this, always when you have multiple missing teeth, there is the challenge is always much, much higher. So my favorite, technique for ridge preservation, tooth transplantation. Um, I will want to show, uh, shortly cover this also at the end of this, of this webinar. Uh, still some minutes left here. Um, this is the preferred technique, especially in young patients. And the best, uh, if you look at the literature, the best uh, prognosis is when we, we have two thirds of the root development and when there's still an open apex, that we have uh, nerves and vessels growing into, into the tooth. Um, here, just like in, in this patient, uh, 11 years old, she had some intrusive trauma when she was a, a small child. And obviously um, this may have contributed to the, to the occurring malformation of the teeth. So she was referred from the orthodontist. She wasn't very compliant. So this treatment had to be done in general anesthesia. Um, and what we do when we, so the treatment concept from the, from the orthodontist was that we transplant these two uh, left second premolars to the central incisor position. You can see the malformed teeth here in the central area. And uh, so this is during surgery, uh, the removed malformed teeth. And here we have some dummy, this where we have Nowadays, we have them much more elegant, but these were, according to the DICOM data, constructed SDL uh, files that um, uh, SDL files that were printed then constructed in analogy to the tooth to be transplanted. So we could use these two um, printed um, dummies here uh, in order to prepare the recipient site in the incisor region. Then we uh, very, um, very gently remove the premolar here. Here, the try-in of the second time here, the first uh, premolar already in position here, second premolar. We do not touch the, the root here, just have it with diamond-coated forceps here, just the crown is touched, 
second premolar imposition, then it's uh, splinted for, for some weeks, not it's um, dynamically splinted um, with the twist flex wires. So we, uh, there can be some movement transferred from the surrounding teeth because uh, we do not want them to be stiffly splinted. So there, there's no, um, no, no uh, ankylosis occurring. And this is the result after, after six months here. Uh, the teeth have been reconstructed with composites and uh, the teeth are vital in position. And look at this soft tissue here that could be maintained. So this is a very nice technique to maintain uh, and to also to create tissue. Here one, um, this is my last case. Um, uh, also this case was referred, this is my last case, I was referred from the from the orthodontic department uh, with uh, multiple tooth agenesis. So the idea was to transplant this second molar here to the upper left side, uh, where you see the green area. Here, this is the primary dentition. You can see there's absolutely no bone. So what we did was uh, like we were preparing the site like for a sinus augmentation, but without filling uh, with a sinus flow elevation, but without filling filling up the uh, the gap uh, with any bone substitute. So this is the tooth extraction. As previously shown, we very gently touch the tooth. We do not touch the only the crown. Uh, we do not touch the root. Then put it here into the prepared site. We can see the uh, Schneiderian membrane membrane being intact. Just put some gelatin sponge just to stabilize the coagulum. Then everything is covered and and splinted again uh, in a dynamic way with a twist flex wire. And this is the situation one year or two years later in 2014. And you can see already the uh, growing roots here. This is the situation when she was um, old enough for orthognatic surgery. And this is the tooth in position vital and with a fully expanded root here. So this is um, something, a very predictable technique also in, in our center we do have quite a long-standing tradition in tooth transplantation especially in, in young patients. So with that please my dear colleagues allow me to conclude. Most important for tissue preservation is the atraumatic tooth extraction. We want to have a stable coagulum and in the in the lateral sides, we also like to use some gelatin sponge and not, not too much. With that, you have already done very much. In the aesthetic zone, uh, we like to augment the soft tissue uh, with the free gingival graft. If you go for um, um, immediate in implantation in patients with thick biotypes, this may also be a treatment option. Um, in the uh, areas where which we prepare for late uh, um, for late implant placement or po pontic area, uh, we do the uh, thin and the, and the thin gingival biotype. We do the um, soft tissue augmentation, and we also like to fill up the uh, like to fill up the um, um, the extraction socket in the young patients. Uh, the favorite technique is the tooth transplantation, and this has really proven to be a very predictable and very nice treatment option uh, for the young patients. So we, when we are asked the question, how important is tissue preservation after tooth extraction, um, we consider there's a VIP treatment in the aesthetic zone and in patients with a thin biotype because we really want to use the time point of extraction to prepare the tissue in a nicer way. And in order, especially also for medically compromised patients, in order to potentially avoid later uh, massive reconstruction needs. By that, um, I'm at the end of my lecture, but I would also like to mention and to announce our long-standing collaboration, I have to say, together with the Alphagate company. And we have been doing several courses and lectures together. And I also want to announce a um, hands-on cadaver course, which we have uh, planned for this year, November, on the 19th, 20th of November uh, at the, the anatomy department. We don't know how travel restrictions will, will, um, will be during this um, 
during during the will develop during the next year but we we hope that we can we can um, hold this date um, and if it's not possible we'll do the course at the latest so but this is a date which we have been have been announcing uh, right now and it would be a pleasure to see the one or the other um, at our university maybe some other information on our course which we are also hoping that we can run it, which will be next year in the last week of January, where we are uh, having um, in a nice alpine environment in January in Salbach Hinterglen, one of our most famous skiing spots, um, where we're combining really high high end dental education with experts from all over the world. We have hands-on workshops and, and lectures in the morning. Um, then we have uh, break where the concept is uh, that we really also enjoy the environment together and in the afternoon we have the lectures with the with the experts again and uh, with these announcements um, I don't know if there's any questions occurring on the on the live chats uh, but I anyway I would like to thank you very much it's been a pleasure I want to thank the AlphaGate company and if there is any question that cannot be answered uh, during the live chat now this is my uh, email address. Uh, very, it would be a pleasure to answer all the questions and, and if there's um, any further information required with a, with a pleasure.